just want to hear you. I just welfare that do the word is yours. Uh, thank you. Hold on one second. Uh, so first, I'm sharing my uh, PowerPoint presentation in the chat in case it makes easier. It makes it easier for some of you to follow it. Um, that way, you can go back and forth. Uh, second, uh, thanks to uh, Gabriel uh, and Hanato. Uh, this thing they're doing is amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be part of it. Uh, I, last time I was here, uh, I told the same story, but uh, it's been more than a decade when I went to Rio for the first time uh, for a, a conference that was hosted by Noel Spruzner. And uh, it's, it is amazing, uh, inspiring to see how much uh, progress has been made in Brazil in uh, a relatively short period of time on getting people from various disciplines, including philosophy, to work together. So I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be part of it. Uh, and then finally, before I start, uh, I'm going to uh, say, a uh, say a little bit to uh, Gabriela, a transutador, eu tenho aqui uma nota que diz, vá, Thomas, vá de GVGA, uh, eu vou uh, tentar, uh, eu vou uh, provavelmente uh, falhar, uh, just know that, uh, that I have uh, good intentions. So I, I've got it in front of me to remind me to slow down. I can't promise that I'll do a very good job for all that. It's not because I don't have free will, it's because I can't help myself. Okay, so um, the last time I'm gonna share my screen, uh, Last time I was here, I gave a talk that had a similar uh, general idea about it, um, but the, the, the specifics of the talk today are going to be quite different. And so that's, I'll go over a little bit of that first. So in terms of what I'm going to, uh, oh, weird. So now I have a different problem, uh, Gabriel. Uh, it is, I am able to share the full screen, but, uh, oh, there we go. Okay. It wouldn't let me advance. So here's an overview of the presentation. Uh, first, I'll discuss the roles very briefly, the roles played by desert and dangerousness uh, in the criminal law. Then I'll discuss recent developments in uh, bioprediction uh, and in biocriminology when it comes to predicting criminal behavior. Third, I'll discuss research on two target populations. This research has been conducted. One is on people that have uh, the MAOAL uh, allele of the MAOA gene, and the other will be uh, psychopaths. Fourth, I'll discuss the, the debate between Morse, uh, Stephen Morris on the one hand, and Josh Green and Jonathan Cohen on the other hand, about the potential uh, or lack thereof uh, transformative power of mechanistic accounts of human behavior, at least where the law is concerned. And then finally, I'll discuss some of the relevant uh, findings from experimental philosophy and social psychology when it comes uh, both to what people already believe about agency and responsibility and whether these beliefs are likely to change. And if they are likely to change, uh, how might they change and what might uh, cause those changes? So the last time uh, I was uh, honored to be giving a talk to this amazing audience, uh, I was interested in uh, what I've called scientific skepticism. So these are mostly uh, epiphenomenalists of one stripe or another. So people like Sam Harris, uh, to a lesser degree, maybe Mike uh, Gazaniga, uh, Dan Wagner, uh, David Eagleman. Uh, Libet's work often gets uh, interpreted this way, some of the stuff we've already seen. And so they're the, these are often scientists who uh, themselves are sort of act actively promoting and publicly promoting the idea. Uh, that we don't have uh, free will. And the sort of, uh, the claim they make is, is mostly global in scope, right? It's the idea that like free will is an illusion, right? Which is why you get the, the, the metaphors here of like puppets on strings and everything else. And so I'm gonna talk about something slightly different today. It is in the ballpark. Both of these two talks I've given, both the last one and the one today are, um, part of a book length project uh, that I've been working on for the last two or three years. And 
and so that they, there's going to be some overlap between what I say today and what I said last time. So I apologize for those of you who sat through it last time. You're going to sit through some of it again today. Um, but but there, there's also uh, I think there's some things that are quite different uh, in the way that these things are going to uh, be presented and received uh, by the public. And I think an awful lot of attention gets paid to what you see on the screen now, and much less attention gets paid to uh, what the kind of books you see on the screen uh, now. So I, today I'm interested in what you might call a sort of creeping mechanism, or what I expect to be a kind of creeping mechanism uh, from bio, biocriminology. And biocriminology just being uh, the attempt to, uh, I'm using it very broadly as the attempt to shed light on the biopsychosocial. You could add neuro, if you want the neuro to be separate from the bio, it's easier to lump them together. So. Um, Adrian Rain calls this neurocriminology. Um, I prefer biocriminology because that more obviously in, includes the behavioral genetics and other things like that. Um, and the idea is that uh, I think, so the story is going to go, uh, that uh, the sort of reductive accounts uh, and biological accounts that, that are going to become more prevalent in, uh, in the context of criminal behavior uh, may very well spill over because people will start to wonder, well, what's the difference? If we find people, for instance, less responsible because they have some sort of um, causal story about why they are um, the way that they are, how different is, is it just a matter of luck that I happen not to have all those biological predispositions? And so I'm interested in this one because I think um, it, it's not uh, as uh, widely discussed. And if anything, it might just lead people to think they have less agency and responsibility rather than with the scientific skepticism thinking they have no uh, agency or responsibility at all. So that's the, that's the story for today. That's the topic of today. Um, first, there are two different approaches. I mean, two is, I don't mean only two, but there are at least two uh, approaches to jurisprudence. Um, Stephen Morris has called these the dessert-based um, and dangerousness-based approaches to jurisprudence. Um, I think, at least in the U.S., to pick one example, we're quite focused on dessert. In some countries around the world, there might be more focused on uh, dangerousness. These things are not mutually exclusive, and indeed in the U.S., they both play an important role inside the criminal justice system. Uh, unfortunately, uh, while they do play, both play a role inside the criminal justice system, the role they play can often be at counter purposes. So doing what you can to uh, minimize a offender's dangerousness, for instance, might be the very sort of thing that would violate his desert. And giving someone the harsh, harsh, harsh treatment he deserves might just make him more dangerous. So these things often are, are sort of thrown into the same jurisprudential mix, uh, but for all that, uh, they can be at counter purposes. So here's just a couple, uh, a, a quick glimpse at the, the way that um, desert plays a role inside the law. Um, the philosophical orientation here is usually uh, retributivistic. Um, the most common context is sentencing decisions. And usually it, the way this works is that moral desert and culpability act as uh, limiting conditions on punishment. Um, this is what Norval, Mor uh, Norval Morris called um, the, the, the desert sets the uh, ceiling and the floor of the sentence. So the upper boundary and the lower boundary are fixed by dessert. And then having fixed it in that way, you can decide sort of fine tune the sentence between those relying on the sort of uh, normal consequentialist or utilitarian considerations. But the, the ret retribution is gonna play uh, the primary role for these uh, decisions. Dangerousness on the other hand, it is more aptly, uh, it's a better fit for um, the kind of utilitarian uh, uh, framework, partly because when you're trying to deter people, what you're trying to do is to prevent, in many cases, dangerous people from harming other people. Uh, when you're, you, you're preventing dangerous people, if you're rehabilitating, you're trying to rehabilitate what are often dangerous people. Not all offenders are dangerous in that way, but, um, but that's the general idea. Uh, risk assessment in the criminal law is ubiquitous. Uh, you, you find it in contexts as uh, diverse as bail, uh, capital punishment, civil commitment, sexual predator statutes, parole, sentencing, et cetera. 
uh, in multiple legal contexts, the US Supreme Court, for instance, has affirmed the relevance of predictions of future dangerousness. Um, and so uh, it is, it is uh, they are very commonly, uh, it's a very common uh, factor that gets uh, taken into consideration by uh, different levels of the criminal justice system. But of course, uh, the I, I've been talking here about uh, what it means for those desert and dangerousness to play a role inside the justice system, like in legal decision making. But of course, at a higher level, if you look at it in the sort of Rawlsian way um, or the HLR Hart way, at the level of implementation, both dangerousness and uh, desert play a role. But desert and dangerousness also play important roles as general justifying aims of punishment. And here again, they need not be mutually exclusive. Or it, when we punish as a society, are we trying to dispense desert or are we trying to protect ourselves from dangerous individuals? And so I'm going to be more focused on what I just said was more, more focused on the role played by these things inside the law. But it, this, this happens at a, at a higher level of analysis as well. Uh, and I'm also interested in this level, so it'll come up uh, later in the talk. Okay, so the question, now that I've sort of put it on, put everything on the table, uh, the main question is, will advances in bioprediction and advances in uh, biocriminology and the relationship between them, uh, will that shift society from uh, what is now primarily a desert-based uh, jurisprudence to a dangerousness-based jurisprudence, or if you want to look at the higher level of analysis from a desert-based system of punishment to a dangerousness-based system of punishment, or will it push us away from punishment altogether, which is something I'll consider uh, at the very end. Okay, but first, uh, anytime you're going to talk about biocriminology, you have to be upfront and honest about the how fraught this can be. So uh, Cesar Lombroso uh, famously subjected criminality to, he was maybe the first person to subject criminality to scientific scrutiny, and he viewed criminality as fixed and innate. Uh, he introduced the notion of being a uh, born criminal. He thought criminals were viewed as, uh, he viewed them as atavisms, that is throwbacks to primitive forms of life. Uh, he believed criminals were identifiable via physical stigmata, sloping foreheads, unusually shaped ears, protruding jaws, asymmetrical skulls, ironically tattoos. I don't know how that one made it into the physical stigmata, but it was. Um, and maybe as it should not be too surprising, uh, this kind of biological account of criminality uh, took a sinister and you might think a predictable turn. So this is the sort of early phases of what you see here of the American uh, eugenics movement. So you saw a shift um, from biocriminology of the kind that Lebroso favored to eugenics uh, in the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, the focus at that point was on specifically feeble-mindedness and antisocial and criminal behavior, and that eventually uh, led to the specter of biological racism and the evils of Nazi Germany. Just to give you a, 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 a feel for how dangerous this can be, um, this is written by a, a one of the, the greatest jurists. I think many people who follow jurisprudence would say is one of the greatest jurists um, uh, in history. Um, uh, Judge, uh, Judge Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. This is from 1927, a, a very famous landmark uh, steriliz forced sterilization uh, case uh, called Buck v. Bell. And he said, we have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. It would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sat the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices, often not felt to be such by those concerned in order to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. So I, I don't want to be cavalier in discussing what we're learning about criminality in, from different fields like behavioral genetics and neuroscience and these sorts of things. 
Um, I appreciate that it is fraught um, and it's something we have to be, uh, we have to be very mindful of the seriousness of what it is we're doing. Um, it, can, it can perpetuate stereotypes. It can lead to all manner of bad beliefs and behaviors. And yet for all that, I think that the, the modern or the contemporary uh, genie of biocriminology, if it hasn't left the bottle, it will leave the bottle uh, shortly. And so it is for those of us in philosophy and neuroscience and psychology and criminology and sociology, it is our job to try to forecast um, where this might go and how we might direct it in the most positive way that we can, assuming such a thing is possible. So uh, when I mentioned biomarkers and bioprediction earlier, these things are related. Uh, and here again, some people talk about neuromarkers and neuroprediction. I, I already, I'm, I'm, I'm intending the neuro to be built into the bio. I'm treating bio as a broader category here. Um, so biomarkers are gonna be biological features that can be objectively measured and that serve as an indicator of pathogenic biological processes. They need not be pathogenic. I'm, I'm just making them pathogenic here because we're looking at abnormal uh, psychology and criminal behavior. You could have biomarkers for good things too. Same for bioprediction. So bioprediction is just the using, uh, is the use of biological variables, or in this case, biomarkers for the purposes of risk assessment. If you're interested more generally in the role that biomarkers and bioprediction might play in the law, uh, Walter uh, co-edited a volume with OUP. I don't remember when it was, sometime in the last uh, 10 years, I guess. And it's amazing. The whole volume is, is great. So if you have any interest in some of this stuff I'm talking about, uh, you should check out, uh, check out his volume. Okay, so what I'm going to do is talk about two uh, bioprediction test cases. Uh, on the one hand, uh, ACC activity and recidivism. And on the other hand, what these researchers call brain age and recidivism. And then I'll look at some of the research in biocriminology in two populations here again, namely the MAOAL, uh, people with the MAOAL allele and uh, psychopaths. So both of these bioprediction studies, I know the first one, I'm almost positive also the second one. I think Walter was part of, part of both of these. Um, so if you have more detailed questions about these, um, he'll be happy to answer your questions in the Q&A. Uh, so the background for this first study was that there was pre-existing evidence that damage to the ACC was associated with acquired psychopathic personality. So there was already sort of freestanding evidence of this. And so one of the hypotheses uh, from this team was that they would be able to use fMRI to explore ACC activity during a go-no-go -no -go task. I'll explain that in a second for those of you who don't know what that is which can be used to, and they thought that might be able, they might be able to use that to prospectively predict uh, recidivism. Okay, and the, the go, no-go task, you know, I, I, you're, in, you're in the scanner, let's imagine I do colors. Uh, I'm gonna tell you that every time the screen is green, I want you to hit the button. Every time it's red, I want you not to hit the button. I'm gonna pattern you or condition you to green by giving you more and more green. And then I'm gonna give you a red. And the idea is now that you're conditioned, it's gonna be harder for you to not hit the red straight away. I mean, not to hit the red straight away. And so in some sense it can be measured, it's a measure of a kind of impulsivity or a lack of control in a context where you've asked them to exercise uh, conscious control. And their, their, their prediction about being able to predict recidivism uh, was borne out by the findings. Uh, by combining multimodal uh, neuroprediction models with out of sample cross-validating, they, they were able to accurately predict rearrest uh, 83 point and 83.33% of the cases. Now the, the, they, they, yeah, so that's the first, this is the first of the two. Um, the second one uh, here, they had a slightly different, uh, the, the motivation was slightly different, although the goal was, the prediction was the goal, the same goal, um, which is on the one hand, we already know that chronological age can be a predictor of things like criminality, so you're, more, you're way more likely to be violent if you're 15 than if you're 70. And so they wanted to know whether how old you are chronologically is importantly different from how, how old your brain, how old your brain age might be. And just to, to get a handle on that, imagine you have two different people um, who are the exact same age, 
one of whom has never touched a sip of alcohol, the other of whom has been a heavy drinker for 25 years, you might think that even though their brains are the same chronological age, in some other functional sense, they may not be the same age. So they were interested not in chronological age, but this other thing uh, that they're calling brain age, which was a brain-based measure uh, that was based on multivariate analyses of, in this case, it was structural MRI, so SMRI data rather than fMRI data. And then the question was, is brain age a better predictor of rearrest and chronological age? And the answer was yes. So uh, moreover, they found that the temporal lobe was identified in both volume and density measures as being useful in predicting uh, brain age and rearrest. Okay, so these are just two examples of, you know, as this, as this technology gets better and better, you'll hear about these models more and more often. And then there's just a question about um, when, you're do, when you're doing a better and better job at predicting immoral behavior, how, will, how might that uh, influence the way the public thinks about both the agency and responsibility of offenders, but also their own agency and responsibility? Okay, so that's on the bio prediction end. Now, this is the, what I was just looking at are sort of two reoffense ticking time bombs, right? It could be that what you want to do is you want to get you want to do a better job of predicting which offenders are likely to reoffend. And the bio prediction we just looked at was focused uh, uh, somewhat on that. You might also be interested uh, in what what I'm just what I'm calling pre-offense. So you want to make sure that people who have already offended don't reoffend. But you're also, you also want to be invested in trying to make sure that people who haven't offended don't offend. So the prediction is going to work on both ends. What I was just talking about focused on the on reoffense prediction, and you might also be equally interested in pre-offense prediction. I find the pre-offense pre prediction more problematic because there's going to be a desire, I think, or a, a a movement towards um, trying to predict this kind of behavior in younger and younger populations. And it's precisely that that I think uh, is where the worries I raised earlier um, about biological accounts of criminality more generally being uh, sort of creeping into uh, the, the, uh, the science and the public policy. Okay, so uh, first we're gonna look at, this is the first population I was talking about so um, this is uh, epi sort of epigenetic predispositions to criminality. This started in the early 90s. Uh, the Dutch researcher Han Bruner and colleagues examined a Dutch family that had extremely high levels of intra and intra intergenerational uh, violence uh, across several generations. Uh, male family members exhibited behavior, behavior like domestic violence, assault, arson, and rape. Bruner found that the family had a mutation of the MAOA gene, I'll say something about the gene in a second, uh, which severely limited how much uh, monoamine oxidase A uh, they produced. This MAOA mutation is associated with mental retardation and antisocial and violent behavior. And animal studies, uh, subsequent animal studies, transgenic mice, so knockout mice that they designed not to have the MAOA gene at all, are, are hyper-aggressive and uh, violent. So uh, MAOA uh, is a gene that encodes for, like I said, monoamine oxidase A, an enzyme which helps regulate neurotransmitters at, uh, such as dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Uh, while the members of Bruner's Dutch family had a very rare dysfunctional MAOA gene. Otherwise, if you don't have this kind of dysfunctional gene, everybody has either a high activity allele or a low activity allele version of this gene, um, which, will, which will determine whether you have more or less of the, uh, of the uh, neurotransmitters. And there's, gather, there's gathering evidence that just MAOA L by itself confers increased risk for maladaptive behavior. So what I'm going to talk about now are, is the research on the sort of on some epigenetic findings, but 
just having the MAOAL, there's there's gathering evidence that just being MAOAL uh, is can it can can confer uh, increased risk. Okay, so in a widely discussed study uh, by Caspi et al. back from 2002, uh, it's, this was a longitudinal study that had uh, more than a thousand children that were followed over 25 years. What they found was a gene uh, environment interaction such that um, participants who were male uh, plus had the MAOAL allele and were abused um, were more than twice as likely to have conduct disorders such, uh, excuse me, twice as likely to have conduct disorders as children and, at, and as, as adolescents and three times as likely to be convicted of violent crimes by 26 years of age. Um, there has been there there have been some replication worries raised by this. I have the, I have the slides on another talk if you want me to pull them up later. Um, I think it's the number of, of studies that have replicated this at this point, either closely directly or in also in other ways, is two or three times longer than the number who failed to replicate it. So um, I, I think that um, the, it, it's it's maybe the findings aren't as problematic as some people suggest, uh, but that you might think they're they're morally problematic. Uh, that we should be worried about what, what will happen, what we'll do with this sort of data, which is what I'm, why I'm talking about it today. So in terms of the causal cascade, like how they think this works. So first um, you have uh, the low, the MAOAL allele, uh, then your subject, this is for men, uh, and then your subject to adverse environments. Um, this biases development of neural systems uh, and circuits. They think it leads to hyperactive amygdala and an underactive uh, VMPFC which in turn causes increased negative emotional salience and at the same time, decreased emotional impulse control. And as a result, you get an increased likelihood and intensity of aggressive responses to provocation. So um, I don't know, the, well, I, I can go through it. I don't know that it makes sense to go through this, but I'll just, just so you have a sense of the sort of things. Cause this, this way of explaining criminal behavior is part of what I'm interested in. What does the public think when you tell them these sorts of things about how we explain uh, criminal behavior, violent behavior? So MAOAL carriers uh, have been shown to uh, have decreased engagement of uh, anterior cingulate and ventral prefrontal cortex, which predicted scores on a measure of trait impulsivity uh, during aversive facial emotional processing, for example, of angry and fearful faces. MAOAL subjects showed exaggerated amygdala and insula activation with diminished recruitment of regulatory regions of the prefrontal cortex. Uh, MAOAL carrier showed enhanced reactivity in corticolimbic circuitry to social rejection. And this exaggerated reactivity is associated with trade aggression and interpersonal hypersensitivity. And then finally increased amygdala activation in MAOAL individuals associated with higher levels of self-reported anger reactivity. There's a ton of this stuff. So I'm just giving you a handful just because uh, I want you to have a sense of the sorts of things. The, where, where they're converging on explanations of the underlying neurological and genetic causes that might be associated with this sort of impulsivity. Now, for the MAOAL, the, the, the violent, the, the, the behavior in question is impulsive violence. So these are people who, um, if you bump into them in a bar, um, they may feel disrespected and pick a fight with you. Um, but on, there is also uh, what they call instrumental violence, and this is what happens when you bump into someone in a bar, they don't say a word, uh, they follow you home and they murder your dog or you uh, three days later. And so what I was talking about is sort of like what we're learning about the nature of impulsive violence, but we're also learning uh, quite a bit about the nature of instrumental violence as well. And so uh, psychopathy is a, I'll give you a very brief uh, history. Um, the first, sort of person to start talking about what looks like in roughly the construct we now use uh, when we talk about psychopathy was Philippe Peniel, uh, who talked about madness without delirium. Uh, Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the American Declaration of Independence, talked about the derangement of the moral faculties. Uh, James Callis, the Scotch, the Scotchman, Scotsman, uh, James Callis Pritchard talked about moral insanity. Uh, and then the, the sort of modern term psychopathy was introduced by Julius Koch in the late 1800s. But the modern uh, construct that most of us uh, are, are talking about when we talk about psychopathy traces back to uh, Cleckley's uh, The Mask of Sanity in the early 40s. 
So the uh, stand, the sort of gold standard standard for measuring uh, psychopathic traits is uh, Robert Harris PCLR. Uh, and it, there is uh, earlier it used to just be a two-factor model. Now they have a two-factor, four-facet model. Um, the first factor, uh, the items are interpersonal and affective. Uh, the second factor, um, the, the traits are uh, involved social deviance. For facet one, this uh, relates to the interpersonal uh, traits of psychopathy. They're glib and superficial. Uh, they, they have grandiose self-worth. Uh, they are pathological liars, or they, they have a, a propensity to be pathological liars. They're conning and manipulative. For the second facet, this is, these are going to be affective deficits. Uh, they lack remorse or guilt. Uh, they exhibit shallow affect. Um, they lack uh, empathy to behave and, and, and speak in callous ways. And they have a seeming sometimes inability to accept a uh, responsibility for their actions. Facet three, uh, this is their different the lifestyle element of psychopathy. They have a need for stimulation, excuse me, they have a need for stimulation. Um, they're prone to boredom. Uh, they have a parasitic lifestyle. They have a lack of realistic long-term goals. Um, they're highly impulsive and they're very irresponsible. And then finally, they there's an antisocial element. So they have poor behavioral controls, um, early behavioral problems, uh, juvenile delinquency. Uh, they often have their condition release revoked and they are criminally uh, versatile. So in terms of psychopathy for the purpose of risk assessment and given what I've been saying, the focus of this, at least part of the focus of this talk is on dangerousness. This is uh, relevant to that. So in the, the very well-funded uh, Monaghan et al. 2000 fund uh, MacArthur risk study called the McRisk study, uh, they found that out of the 134 initial risk factors that they included in their risk assessment tool, the single most powerful risk factor for differentiating high risk from low risk groups was the PCL-SV, which is a shortened version of the PCLR. The model, more importantly, when you removed the PCL-SV scores from the model, it ceased to be predictive at all. So what, th when I say it's the single most, this is misleading because without it, the model ceased to be uh, predictive. More recently, uh, Lystico et al. did a meta-analysis of 95 uh, non-overlapping studies, and they found that psychopathy was uh, similarly predictive of uh, antisocial behavior across different ages, adolescents versus adults, study methodologies, prospective versus retrospective, and different types of outcomes, institutional infraction versus uh, recidivism. Now, I, didn't, I don't have that, that slide here, but let me just say, this is partly, this is important for the following reason. Um, most estimates suggest that psychopaths um, make up only 1% or less of the overall population. And while the estimates that I'm getting ready to suggest vary from as low as 25 to a, as high as 50%, depending on the state, depending on the country, um, psychopaths uh, commit, if you're looking at just violent crime, psychopaths commit between 25 and 45% of all violent crime. That's the estimate. So if you're interested in danger, identifying dangerous people, then like placing your bet on the psychopaths in the world is a pretty good, uh, been a good, good place to look. Now I'm looking at some of the more recent stuff here again, we could look at more of this, um, but I, I, it's more just to give you a sense of what some of the stuff that's been coming out. So they, find, they found reduced activation in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and anterior temporal cortex when distinguishing between moral and non-moral images. Uh, they have blunted amygdala responsiveness during affective perspective taking, weaker VMPFC engagement in response to empathogenic and facial emotion uh, stimuli and prefrontal dysfunction and problems with inhibitory uh, control. Interestingly enough, I don't wanna, the one, it's a way of distinguishing, you know, not all, Indeed, not all psychopaths are serial killers. Um, lots of serial killers are uh, psychopaths. And part of the difference may be that they have um, part of the problem that normal psychopaths have, they don't have. So they don't have impulsivity problems. So they have the same deficits and other same deficits as psychopaths in other ways, lacking remorse, lacking guilt, and these sorts of things. Um, but they don't have problems with, with, uh, with impulse control. And it makes it easier for them to get away with being 
uh, the serial killers that they are. We also have, uh, there's a lot of work that's been done in the last couple of years using structural MRI instead of uh, uh, functional MRI. So impulsive antisocial uh, psychopathic traits are linked to increased volume within the prefrontal cortex. Uh, another study by the same, uh, another paper by the same group, uh, impulse, uh, impulsive antisocial dementia and psychopathy linked to enlargement of the striatum. Uh, abnormal cortical gyrification in criminal psychopathy. And then finally, they found affective and interpersonal psychopathic traits associated with reduced corpus callosum volume among male inmates. So I say current theory, this is a current theory. Um, I won't say that it's obviously universally accepted, but it's uh, there's a lot of, lot of the researchers who are looking at psychopathy are sort of converging on a particular way of looking at this. It looks like the fMRI and smRI Results suggest that maladaptive behavior in psychopathy may arise from dysfunction within corticolimbic and corticostriatal circuitry involved in affective arousal, emotion regulation, and value-based uh, decision-making. So let's just imagine that scientists keep doing more of what I was just talking about. So scientists are giving uh, explanations of impulsive violence in terms of something like the MAOA gene and talking about the fact that people that have the MAOA are more likely to engage in violent behavior when they were abused, males, if, if they were abused as children, or talking about psychopaths, the different things that might cause psychopaths to be the way that they are, or that undergird um, their various uh, dysfunctions. What is that likely to do, if anything, to uh, public opinion and the way we approach these um, target populations and the law? And just as I'll give two examples of the interplay between uh, public opinion and the way that public opinion can influence the law. Uh, this is from the attempted assassinate, assassination of, uh, of Ronald Reagan uh, by Hinckley. Uh, and Hinckley was found uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. Indeed, he just got out recently. Still, people are outraged that he got out even now. Uh, but it, it, it sent such a shock through the American body politic that multiple states either changed their insanity defense to make it harder for people to qualify, or in three cases, got rid of the insanity defense altogether. And so that's just, so I, it's a proof of concept. Um, it's clear that uh, what people think about uh, the way we respond to criminals, the way we view criminals in the criminal justice system can influence the way the public thinks uh, the justice system ought to be run. Another example, this is from Norway. Um, this is Breivik, the serial killer, uh, who killed, not serial killer, the mass murderer who killed everybody in the act of domestic terrorism. And Norway normally has sort of widely recognized uh, quote unquote progressive uh, views about um, punishment and responsibility and the criminal law. And uh, this generated what some researchers have called a punitive turn in Norway. So people wanted him to get the death penalty. People wanted him to get a harsher sentence. People, so even, in a, even among progressives, um, there was a tremendous amount of public pressure for the law to move in one way rather than another when it comes to how we uh, treat criminal offenders. So which way will the biopredictive wind blow? Uh, will it be forward or backwards or neither? Or is it blowing at all? So the thing that I'm most interested in is this notion that what you have in, in advances in areas like biocriminology, historically, what you want is something like this. So you have progressives, that, I'll get, speak for myself. So you wanna say, well, um, I don't think humans have the kind of free will we take ourselves to have. I don't think we're deeply responsible in the way that people assume. I think that the more we can dislodge a very robust sense of agency from people's minds, um, it will have a civilizing effect on the way we approach criminals. So that's the, ho the hope, if you wanna say the hope. You might think the hope is that we will move away from this uh, uh, ruggedly retributivistic approach to something more scientifically informed, um, 
uh, that does a better job of rehabilitating and these other sorts of things. But the worry is that it isn't gonna have that effect. It's gonna have some different effect, right? So it's not going to, even if you displace dessert, even if dangerousness were to displace dessert, if the dangerousness is deemed to be biological or innate or neurological or genetic or however, you, whatever like reductive level of analysis you wanna present it, people then think you're intrinsically dangerous. So it's, it might be true that any evidence for dangerousness may make it such that you're less deserving. So it might re reduce our deservingness intuitions, but then the desire to protect yourself from the person is only going to increase. So it will, it will end up having the, the it will like be uh, aggravating, an aggravating condition rather than the mitigating condition people like me probably had hoped for. And so there's a, I think it's an open question of whether or not um, the kind of findings I, I was just discussing might have a quote unquote civilizing effect. I, I suspect it may have the exact opposite of that effect. Um, it's true that we may not um, treat people as harshly in the sense that we may not make their lives as miserable on a day in and day out basis, but there's a good chance that people will just never get out of jail. Now you might think that's how it should be. Um, should psychopaths ever get out of jail? We could talk about we, we can talk about that uh, later. So it's there is this worry that dangerousness based punishments may be harsher than dessert based punishments in certain ways. And in that way, the progressives who wanted to use this to civilize civilize the law uh, end up not getting what they wanted. So uh, now this is the stuff that's similar to what I said last time when I was here. Uh, there are at least two questions. Uh, one is, uh, what effect will developments in biocriminology likely have on public opinion in the law? Uh, answering this question is just a straightforwardly empirical question. The normative question is, what effect uh, should developments in biocriminology have on public opinion in the law? And answering this question is a philosophical matter. I will say a little bit about that later. Normally, for reasons I'll make clear, I'm interested in the descriptive question, um, but but I do but I do think these things as I explained last time uh, are related. Why? Because I think the answer to the former descriptive question is relevant to answering the latter question. So here I'm I'm always inclined to treat popular opinion or public opinion or folk intuitions or common sense, whatever you want to call that, as a kind of feasibility constraint on philosophically philosophical theorizing when it comes to the law and public policy, at least if we're talking about democratic societies where the law is going to be shaped in various ways by public opinion. And so if it turns out that public opinion is out of step with one's own normative theory or one, one's own preferred policy, then you have to have some plan for influencing people, influencing public opinion, if you want your theory to be practically implementable. So to just I'll forecast a bit. So if you ask me the, what I take to be the, the answer to the normative question, if I'm just talking in a purely idealized way, I don't think that um, we should have punishment at all. We should have a purely preventive model, which I'll talk about later. But getting from where people are to that, it's not, clear what, it's not clear what that involves. And so it, it might mean that what I have to do is figure out how to move people as far towards what I want as I can, knowing they'll never get to where I want to be. But that interplay between one's theoretical commitments and one's desire to make sure that one's theory is doing some kind of work in the world um, requires you to do the kind of research at the crossroads of these different disciplines, which are the reasons reason we're all here uh, today in the first place. So the uh, debate between, I wanna talk for a second about the debate between uh, Green and Cohen, and on the one hand is Stephen Morse. So Morse thought the findings from neuroscience and genetics are legally relevant only at the margins. Um, he thought that they leave our legal practices largely intact. 
and he's really looking at the letter, looking mostly at like the letter of the law, and he thought the law was uh, compatibilist in its nature. Green and Cohen instead thought that the mechanistic nature of, they were talking neuroscience, I'm talking bioscience because I'm wanting a broader application, will challenge the traditional picture of agency and responsibility. So on their view, while the law as it stands is compatibilist by design and practice, they thought it would change in the wake of scientific advances, which would change public opinion, which would change the law. So they have two different, uh, two, a disagreement about whether um, the future was going to just, like the status quo was gonna prevail, or we were gonna get some sort of radical uh, revisionism of our normal way of thinking about and implementing uh, the criminal law. Now, uh, Green and Cohen thought that there were uh, sort of a, a triad of uh, views that were all enmeshed with the normal common sense uh, view of metaphysics and morality. Um, they thought that most people were libertarian. That is, they have a view of the uh, of free will that requires something like um, the uh, unconditional ability to do otherwise, requires indeterminism, requires genuine alternative possibilities and all that. So they thought people were, they think people were libertarians. They think most people were dualists. And they think uh, most people and anti-reductionists or non-reductionists, and uh, most people are uh, retributivists. I'm not sure how much of this I want to go through. I'll go through. I'll, I'll get. I'll give it a, a truncated version. Um, so, for several years now, I've been working uh, on developing a scale and then extending it in future studies. Um, so we, we developed the free will inventory, which uh, Gabrielle is going to talk about some tomorrow, which I'm excited to hear what the results from the, st the study they did with the members of the audience from the last time. Uh, there are three subscales, uh, free will, determinism, and dualism. Uh, and unsurprisingly, most people believe in free will and dualism and do not believe in determinism. Part two was a little bit different. It was to try to shed more fine grain light on people's beliefs and attitudes uh, about agency. And here uh, we found that the overwhelming majority of participants believe in something like libertarian free will and retribution, just to give you a sense of what this looks like. So this is uh, one of the libertarian items. Uh, free will is the ability to make different choices, even if everything leading up to one's choice, for example, the past, the situation, and their desires, beliefs, et cetera, was exactly the same. And this, this is one of the, the first studies we did with the, the, um, the uh, scale once we'd already developed it and validated it. Uh, there were 468 participants, and as you see, 79% uh, of the participants uh, agreed. We, this is a trichotomize, just to give you a sense of like, th these are people who either uh, somewhat agreed, agreed, or strongly agreed. We're lumping them together just so I can get a, um, a pie graph. Another one, uh, uh, to have free will is to be able to cause things to happen in the world without at the same time being caused to make those things happen. Uh, here, the agreement isn't as strong. Um, but only 70% uh, disagreed, 54% uh, uh, agreed in one form or fashion or another. Uh, dualism, to give you a sort of example of this, the fact that we have souls that are distinct from our material bodies, what makes humans unique, this is 73%. Uh, human action, this is the one that we're most interested in, human action can only be understood in terms of our souls and minds, and not just in terms of our brains, this is 61%. Uh, the human mind can not simply be reduced to the brain, 68%. So that gives you a feel for what, what I take to be, this is the kind of evidence that I find uh, compelling when it comes to whether or not Green and Cohen are right about um, whether people are, whether, whether libertarianism is part of the common sense, common sense understanding of free will, whether dualism is part of the common sense understanding um, of agency. And I think the answer to those questions is that they are. Now, in a more recent study, this got referenced earlier, I don't remember earlier today or yesterday, uh, was Newski et al. 2019. Uh, they ran a large cross-cultural study the, uh, with 1,800 participants, 900 each one. Uh, half of the participants were American, half were in Singapore, uh, and they found that score across, cutting across the two populations, scores in the uh, dualism subscale were highly predictive of scores on the free will subscale. They also found that 80% of the participants who agreed with the libertarianism items also agreed with the dualism items. And these findings suggest at least prima facie that deterministic, mechanistic, and reductionistic accounts of human agency could impact folk intuitions about free will, moral responsibility through either of two routes, either because they put pressure on 
the libertarianism element or because they put pressure on the dualistic element or both. Now, folk retributivism here, the evidence for this is huge. And there's whole literature on this. I'm just giving you an example from the scale. Um, uh, people who harm others deserve to be punished, even if punishing them won't produce any positive benefits to either the offender or society. For example, rehabilitation, deterring would-be offenders, et cetera. And we do this, 75% of people agree with it. And I found in subsequent work that their scores on this retributivism item um, uh, is predictive of, excuse me, their free will scores and their, and their retributivism items um, predict uh, their performance on uh, economic retributive, how retributivistically people behave uh, when playing economic games and also how likely people are to support uh, vigilantism. Um, one of the highest things we found, there's a scale for measuring vengeance. It's called the vengeance scale. It is amazing. Um, and the, the correlation, I don't remember how high it is between just a single free will, just a single retributive item and this, the overall score on the vengeance scale is, is, very, uh, is very high. Okay, um, I think I'm gonna skip. How am I doing on time? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll skip this because I don't know. Um, well, I'll skip the next one. Let me do at least, I'll do at least this one. 5.53, so you, you, you can... Okay, perfect. Free, free. perfect. So um, this, this research is interesting to me for two reasons. Um, I think some of the work of mine I talked about last time I was here showed that the problem that, uh, that Namius et al, Namius and colleagues, they opened a Pandora's box with what they've done with this, these findings um, such that I think they have unwittingly problematize the ability to use the data on folk intuitions to shed light on um, the philosophical theories about free will. But I'm not interested in that for today. And so it's, it's important to know that what they found was if you give people deterministic scenarios, people, depends on the wording of the scenarios, but if you give them deterministic scenarios, people will um, generally they're, they're more compatibilist friendly than I would have predicted as someone who was part of some of those early studies. Um, but depends on how you word the determinism. If I take the determinism and instead make it neurodeterminism, so instead of talking about the determinism at the level of like beliefs at the folk psychological level, so I just talk about neurons and, and neural pathways, people find neurodeterminism far more threatening than just garden variety determinism. So there's this, this they call it bypassing. The, I, the, the worry is that when you give people um, neurological accounts of human behavior, they interpret them in a way that suggests they are reading, they are concluding that epiphenomenalism is true from the suggestion that determinism is true. So people have a very hard time keeping that the, the, it, it's easier for them to keep their, their, their view of free will and responsibility in the face of just regular deterministic scenarios. But as soon as you add a neurological element, people find that much more threatening. And that's relevant to the sort of stuff we've been, we've been talking about today. Now, there's a pushback, which I'm, I'm not gonna talk about. Um, what I will say is for the people who don't, you know, I just said many people who read these neurodeterminism studies uh, will interpret them to mean that uh, the agent's been bypassed, that his conscious deliberation and he, who he is and all these things have been bypassed. Um, but it's also true that the people who don't make that mistake, <laughs> the bypassing mistake, are inclined to view these deterministic scenarios as indeterministic. So one, that's part of what I talked about last time. People's intuitions about these cases are an absolute mess. I mentioned it here just to say, Part of if we're wanting to be in the business of forecasting the way that different uh, developments in biocriminology or neuroscience or whatever are going to affect public opinion and potentially the law, this is the sort of research that we have to uh, undertake. I'm not going to worry about the Sharif for now. This one's more relevant to our current purposes. Um, so these are a couple studies that have been done. Uh, that look more narrowly at the issue that I'm talking about, not neuroscience, um, but something like biocriminology or behavioral genetics and these sorts of things. So Aspinwall et al. from 2012 found that biomechanistic explanations of psychopathy 
influence judicial decision making. There, they gave judges a description of psych, the, like the traits and the the um, the uh, the uh, underlying uh, causes of psychopathy, and those things could be described either at a folk psychological level or at a reductive sort of neurological level. And the idea was that. Um, they did indeed uh, view the psychopaths differently, even though they were psychopaths, they viewed them differently, depending on which of the two ways these explanations were uh, framed. Uh, Skurik and Applebaum and two studies, which were the, the two that, for me, the, the, the studies that are the most interesting because the, the, the data is, it, it's, not a, it's not helpful in terms of figuring out which direction the uh, people's intuitions might go. So what they found, they looked at behavioral genetics and they wanted to know whether it influenced people's judgments. And what they found <coughs> was it did have the effect I suggested earlier. So it did make, it did raise people's judgments about the dangerousness of the offender. So all other things being equal, if you explain an offender, an offender's behavior using a behavioral genetic frame, people will view him as more dangerous. But that enhanced dangerousness didn't um, increase, uh, their, or didn't affect their judgments about punishment. Uh, more recently, this is a, this is a study by Ginchow et al. This, this involved um, also uh, judges here again. Um, so reading anti-free will primes reduced judges' uh, belief in free will. Uh, so it did have that effect, but their recommended sentences were not influenced by their manipulated belief in free will. So the findings here are a lot more mixed. And I, for me, this is an area where a lot more work uh, needs to be done. Um, I, I've, I've been working on some of these for the last year that I just haven't had the time to run. Um, but the, the, the criminal law is replete with scenarios that you can use. You can just pluck them out and then you can just frame them in these different ways to try to see whether or not these frames affect people's judgment to agency and responsibility. So for me, that's where, um, where I think more work, uh, more attention needs to be uh, focused. Okay, so then that takes us back to uh, the debate between uh, Morse on the one hand and Green and Cohen on the other hand, are we likely going to move uh, in the direction of stay in the, stay in the status quo or move uh, in some new uh, transformative direction of change? And that it's going to depend for me, it's going to depend in part on the future of uh, the future impact that bioprediction has. So on the one hand, uh, biocriminology itself um, is reductive. Um, it, it does shift our attention, I think, away from minds uh, to brains. And you might think that um, increased predictive accuracy should lead to uh, perceived decreased agency and responsibility. And it's easy enough if you just imagine perfect prediction. So if you imagine that someone's behavior was perfectly predictable, especially the, far, the further removed you get from the person's behavior, so I, I perfectly predicted everything you were going to do um, 10 years before you were born, then you might think that is going to be, um, that would undermine agency and responsibility. And so part of it is just a function of like, as the predictive accuracy um, improves, uh, is that going to decrease how much agency and responsibility we attribute to um, offenders? Relatedly, uh, will that, uh, is the, if it does have that effect, Let's just imagine it, it does shift us from uh, dessert to dangerousness. And uh, the question is then, what do we do about the dangers of dangerousness? <laughs> like I said earlier, danger of dangerousness is that um, you will, it will overshoot and it'll make sentences way longer than sentences already are. I mean, at least dessert serves as a limiter on how, so if, I, if, if you've been sentenced to, jail for theft. And I think, well, I can't keep you in jail for life for theft. But if I imagine, I think, well, um, you're definitely going to steal stuff again. Like I've, you've got these biomarkers, you're, you're going to be the sort of person I know is going to be in and out of here. Then it, it, it has this um, amplifying effect in terms of the, as, as an aggravating uh, condition. And so uh, what do we do about that? Or is that something that we can do? Can anything be done about that? So one thing you might do this is where I'm going to get back to the normative descriptive thing in a second. Uh, you might think that you should just dispense with the double-edged sword of punishment. So the double-edged sword is a double-edged sword because 
you're simultaneously trying to worry about two things. Dessert, you might think is fundamentally unfair because people don't deserve things in the way that the law suggests. Someone like me, where I don't think we have the type of agency and responsibility, the kind of robust agency responsibility most people assume that offenders have. So the, the, if you make it about dessert, in some ways, the punishments are unfair. If you make it about dangerousness, the punishments are also going to be problematic and unfair. And so in, and they're going to, you're going to tune one and you're going to tune one and they're going to go, they're like at counter purposes. So the thing you might do is you might just get rid of dessert. I mean, get rid of punishment uh, altogether. That's, that's the suggestion. So if you ask like, Thomas, what, what do you think? You know, what do you think would be the right normative thing? What, do you, what, would, you, what would I prefer as a uh, theoretical matter, not as a question of social psychology? Well, I think that the quarantine model that has been developed by Paraboom and Caruso independently and together um, is in the right direction. So the focus is gonna be on something like prevention, uh, detention and rehabilitation. Uh, there is a, the point is to sort of avert dangerousness um, by trying to keep people from becoming dangerous. So it's gonna be modeled on a kind of public health ethics. And if you go this route, it is a treatment model. So it's gonna be like a treatment model or quarantine model as they call it. Um, you're going to abandon not just retributivism as a goal, but punishment itself. So this is a, this is a, a letting go of the very puni of a punitive framework altogether. Of course, like everything else, the devil is in the details. Um, the idea is that the less dangerous offenses would justify less moderate restraints on freedom. You would have possible decriminalization of nonviolent beha behavior, um, which you could treat with uh, other means, like we normally do now with uh, speeding tickets in traffic court or uh, drug use in drug court. Um, this kind of public health model demands a degree of concern for the well being and hence treatment of offenders, which is something our current approach has no uh, interest in. Uh, when rehabilitation isn't possible, it's going to demand or require that the lives of offenders be no more miserable than necessary to keep society safe. And you're going to put preventive measures in place. I mean, preventive measures are going to be pref uh, preferred to incapacitating measures. So if you go back to the pre-offense the pre and re-offense stuff I was talking about earlier, most of your focus is going to be on pre-offense, preventing people from offending in the first place. And when they do offend, you'll adopt the most humane method you possibly can to make it such that you can release them in a way that they are less likely to re-offend. And the biocriminology findings will presumably help with this. This is going to be a broad you know, family of things like developmental psychology, sociology. I mean, there's, there are a ton of things that are going to be part of, the, of figuring out how to structure this. But if you asked me, like, what do I think? That's what I would prefer. It fits, it fits better with my own deflationary views about uh, agency and responsibility. So the problem is that when I tell people this, who aren't people like you sitting in this audience, their first look is the look on the left, and the second look is the look on the right. It, it, even students have a hard time thinking I'm serious. And the ones who think I'm serious think just overwhelmingly think it's impossible. So then what do I do? So I have a normative theory. I don't want it to be merely an ideal theory. I think the, the findings of biocriminology moving forward would be helpful but it's not clear how to move people from where they are to where I'm at, given that the situation we're in, the, dialogue, the, the, the dialectic we're in is something like this. And all I know to do is focus um, my attention on the descriptive question. I, I can work out the details of the, of the theory in f more fully later, but what you wanna know is um, how are people gonna receive this stuff? Why are they gonna receive it? Um, how are they going to receive it? What things move them in which ways and not others? Or can they be moved at all? And then the question for me, which is interesting, is what does it mean if you have a theory at the, at the final analysis that just can't be sold to the public? So that you're, you're, no matter what, you're just, you're just stuck with the, 
the non the non ideal, and then what you want to do is to make the non ideal is um, the least amount of non ideal uh, that you can. That's probably the name of my book. So time will tell how all that plays out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas, very much. Uh, this is Renato. Uh, Thomas, uh, I will I will start the question. I can help myself. Uh, I the the agree the 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 amount to which I agree with you is almost scary. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, so congratulations for for thinking like I do. <laughs> just 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 a joke. Uh, I I I'm really in tune with you in this, but uh, you haven't talked about one thing that really uh, worries me because uh, you've talked a lot about public opinion and uh, I have a deeper concern. That is, whenever I talk to colleagues in, in law school especially, uh, I find the same resistance, the same skepticism and more. I find a lot of them thinking uh, of all of this as illegal, inconstitutional, neo-Lombrosianism, bioprediction is something that they especially from criminal law, colleagues from, from criminal law, they, they think this is uh, outright outrageous, right? And I mean, I, I, I bet you've had the same experience with, with colleagues from criminal law. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to, to, to ask you, how do you deal with this? And, and do you think it's, it's the same problem with public opinion or it's different? Yeah, well, well, I think it, it makes, well, first off, it just means that, that the, the broken bridge I showed you earlier, it just means that the two of us are on one side and then that one person on the other is like everybody else. But um, yeah, it, I think it makes it more depressing, right? Because if, like, if I can't convince philosophers or legal theorists or neuroscientists, the odds of my convincing, you know, my dad, <laughs> sort of like conservative, you know, like the, it, it's like it, it is at floor. So I think so. I, I, that's so. I guess what I was saying at the end, I don't have any like like tips about how to do it, but I, I am interested in the background about this issue of non-ideal theorizing. Because then what I feel like what I'm supposed to ask myself at some point is, all right, so you're not going to move them to where you want them to be. But it seems like there has to be a way of explaining the data in a way that's like scientifically respectable and, 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 and conceptually coherent and uh, that might move them in the right direction. And then so I'm interested in that, right? I mean, it's like, it's like everything else. You have to make these sort of incremental changes, I guess. Um, it's interesting because I, I try so hard not to try to give my students sales pitches. Because like that, that'd probably be the way, if you're asking like, how would you do it? The way to do it is just try to convert all your students. <laughs> right? And then send them out into the world. But like that's, you can't do that. That's not the way to teach. And so, um, yeah, I don't, it's hard. I don't know. I'm not sure. Look, it could just be that the reason no one's convinced is because they ought not be convinced. And these views are, um, are, not, are not the right views to have. I'm, 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 that, that obviously could be true. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. But I will say this, you're, you're right. Depends on the circle, you'll, you'll be accused of racism, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, uh, thank you, Thomas. It, I, I, sure. I feel the same. I can't convince my, my students or my dad either. So. <laughs> <laughs> Santiago has a question and then, yeah. Hi, Professor Neidhover. Thank you for your follow. Oh, of course. Uh, my name is Carolina. So um, I'm afraid to start on another subject, actually, but I, I'll say anyway. Um, I find really interesting feeling the phenomena of belonging. And uh, belonging usually brings bad things too. So, uh, races, xenophobia, etc. So, I, I, um, for me, of course, this social 
questions are biological too, and uh, we don't understand it completely yet. But um, sometimes we, can, sometimes all the time, we can see clearly a kind of psychopathic traits in people that uh, are not uh, diagnosed as psychopaths. Uh, and uh, I would like to know your thoughts on on this matter because we yes oh, I can talk about it but <laughs> so and that's um, yes that's it because it's it's about biology too it's about crime too and have this social factor but it, it doesn't change things at all in in my view so what do you think about it um well let me let me just give you an example of this is a way of this this loops back to what i was saying um if you if you asked me years ago and I, about like a psychopathic like a psychopath that did these horrible things, I would have looked at them as, you know, like an evil person maybe, or I would, I would have moralized it in a certain way. Um, and like now I think, well, um, I have a better understanding of how they end up the way that they are. And so it's not like I'm, I'm excusing them in some sense, um, uh, but, but I, I don't view them as in the same way responsible as I, I might have done before. And so I, I guess on the, 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 hope, the hope I was sort of raising was that um, maybe um, biologizing um, or neurologizing these, um, these things um, would both make us more uh, sympathetic, maybe not the rest word, understanding is a better word, um, with offenders of different type of offenders. Um, and that, it, which I didn't talk as much about, but the idea is that... Uh, if you can get people to be sympathetic or at least understanding with psychopaths, you should be able to get people to be understanding with people who disagree with them about politics or something else like that. So I haven't, I haven't, I haven't had the sense that this has a background could have like further implications. I was just looking at it very narrowly with respect to the, um, to the, to the offenders themselves. Uh, but there is, but having said that, um, you were you you mentioned other ways. Of, I, I take it you were talking about the danger of like essentializing things. So like now, if I make, for instance, like uh, transsexuality or homosexuality or uh, criminality, all, all, if I if I take all of these things that we might not want to essentialize because they have a sociological uh, uh, component, and I essentialize them, then it could create all sorts of problems with how we treat people. Race is that way. I mean, there are a lot. There are going to be a lot of examples like that. So it's, it is, I, th I guess that's part of why I was saying I thought it was um, dangerous in a way. I'm not sure that, I feel like that didn't answer your question, but. Um. Hey, Thomas, it's Adina. Hi. Thank you for a terrific talk. Um, I, I guess I, I'm one of the people who sort of disagrees with you. Um, for one thing, it seems to me that um, at least some forms of what you might term punishment are uh, sort of necessary just for teaching people, training people in yeah. all kinds of ways. I mean, negative feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. And so one, one question is, what do you mean get rid of punishment entirely? Do you really mean like all forms yeah. of punishment? Like, yeah. Uh, say, Sorry, you can't have your dessert tonight because of what you did. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, good. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll take the, uh, let me, I'll just answer that one quick. I really meant like uh, incarceration, punitive incarceration. Okay. I really meant okay. something like that. Because I think in some sense, like traffic tickets are punishment. No, sorry, I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. Like yeah. Some of the things yeah. that you suggested as alternatives, I think of yeah. as, as forms of very effective punishment. Um, yeah, I think, but to be fair, like to your point, not to be fair to me, to be fair in the other direction. So if I just say it that like that, well, I mean incarceration, but 
then the response is right. But so how does, so you're going to, but you are going to have to de- quarantine people. Right. And that's that. So that's not incarceration. Now I'm playing devil's advocate. This is how I take it. You're, you can push me. <laughs> like you know, that's yeah. so then I think, all right, so it's quarantine, not incarceration. And then it, it's, it's like, I can't just beg the question by saying, Oh, well, what makes it incarceration is that the point of it is not punishment. I mean, that's what I want to say. Right. So it is incarceration and it's incarceration in this sense. Not, not, I mean, it, it's not punishment in this sense. It, the punishment isn't the goal. Like it's true that like I'm depriving you of liberty while you're being rehabilitated or whatever else it is. And that's aversive. So I can't make it like not aversive, but if I could, I would. So like the, whatever, aversive element I build in is necessarily baked in. I can't like, I can't like get it out of it. I've gotten as much of that out as I can. Whereas like incarceration, like it seems like in some ways, like part of the point is for it to be punitive. Yeah. Like, so I guess I would say something like that, but it can't, you're right that it can't be no, no punishment in, in general. That obviously doesn't make any sense. It's more like, I, I, I really mean like a, a quarantine model of what to do with offenders rather than the incarceration model that we have. That's what I should say. Okay. So um, I mean it doesn't make it any more plausible. <laughs> well right? I'm gonna make a suggestion yeah, that sure. um, may help. I mean I think one of the problems especially with bio uh prediction and biomarkers and things like that is that um people have a really terrible understanding of biology and genetics and they have this, uh, you know, they believe in genetic determinism, and I think they believe in, you know, m- mechanistic determinism. Yeah. And um, and if you could maybe even just educate them on like pea plants and norms of reaction, and realize that that uh, even these biomarkers, the, you know, the fact that you express some sort of biomarker does not mean that you are uninfluenceable, right? And so the whole yeah. point of the quarantine yeah. is to, to influence in a yeah. way that leads to positive outcomes. And, and um, that may be a way to make it a little more palatable. Uh, you know, I think that part of this, p- part of the reason you get such pushback is that people think that these things are fixed and that nothing yeah. they do is going to make a difference. And if you can put it in a context where you can show that, that even if determinism is true, causality still works, you can still influence uh, the course of events. Maybe they were the, the way that yeah. they were going to turn out anyway, but because you were going to influence them. So um, I just think that make, might make it easier for them to swallow. Yeah, it's funny. So when you say it that way, Dina, there's a way in which that's what when my students ask me, because this comes up because they know I, they know I don't believe in free will, for instance, and then they're curious, like they're generally curious, like, what does it even mean? And I have to tell them, well, look, here are all the things I think you can do. Like you have you can still do all these things. I mean, this one thing like you, these are these this is there's a cluster of things you don't have because I don't think you have these capacities, but there are all these other super important things that matter for all sorts of reasons. That's similar to what you're saying here. Like, there's the same kind of thing. Um, so part of it is getting people, you, you, there are two different pieces of this. One is I didn't, I haven't been for the, what I'm talking about today. I wasn't thinking about whether people were interpreting these things properly or improperly. I'm assuming that they'll be, they'll be liable to interpret them improperly because the scientists like, just like in the, in the neuroscience case are presenting the data improperly. And so they're telling everyone epiphenomenalism when, so part of me, I'm interested in like, well, what, assuming that, that scientists talk those ways, what effect will that have, regardless of whether or not the scientists are misrepresenting the science or the people are understanding the misrepresentation or misunderstanding a proper presentation or, so like there are all those pieces too, on top of what you just said, there are, the, there are also those pieces. And I guess what I, what I should say, what I want at the end is, I want people to have a, a proper understanding of the science in the hopes that having a better understanding of the science will make people more understanding of human behavior as it actually is. Yeah. I, not, I, what they, I, not what they take it to be. So, I, so what you just said is, at, so I, for me, like ultimately I want that. I didn't, that didn't come out today because I was just thinking about like, here are the findings, what might people think about that? 
I wasn't even thinking about like what would happen if you made them understand it or whatever else. But you're absolutely right about that piece. That is absolutely a fundamental piece. Yeah. Just just as a, an example, like you mentioned yeah. the Caspi paper, but the Caspi paper is about gene by environment interactions, yeah. right? And yeah. it's, it's that, uh, it's the environmental mm -hmm. part of it that that is so important. And I think that the more that you can underline that, the, the yeah. more effective your position will be. And also not deterministic. Well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> on top of that yeah no but no but you, uh, you, so you were saying look it's the it's also the environment part so it's not only is the gene not determining it but it's like yeah but even the gene environment interaction is not determining it it's like nothing's determining it it's not determined a deterministic process all throughout right these are just like it enhances adds conferred risk to future behavior or something that seems right that was good thank you dean that was all very helpful thank you Adina didn't want to say whether it was deterministic or non-deterministic. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, yeah. I have um, a question that goes a little bit in that direction. Um, and it's, um, so it's a sort of, but it's a sort of different kind of worry. Um, it's a worry, I'm not sure if it's a worry about how you know, the lay public will receive the theory, but about, you know, which aspects or which things the theory is emphasizing. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I don't mean to dispute that there are uh, features and personal features that explain crime and misbehavior, but it's certainly the case that there are contextual and structural features that also explain why, you know, certain forms of misbehavior uh, just are so common and widespread. So mm -hmm. if you think about our students, well, the fact that why are they plagiarizing uh, more now than they were doing before? Uh, we both said that's true. Well, it's presumably because there's more, you know, available materials to plagiarize, and there's an increased pressure on. Uh, you know, grades as a way of, 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 you know, measuring success. And, you know, one of the things that we, I think we should do is to think whether there are certain things that we should change in our practice to avoid. Uh, so instead of thinking that there's something wrong with our students, we should be uh, asking ourselves whether we should, you know, change the materials by which we evaluate students and the emphasis that we place on scores. Hmm? So I think that, you know, maybe just thinking too much about biomarkers can have kind of like the same, the contrary effect. Is we're gonna be thinking a lot about people and, you know, making, you know, put a lot of pressure on, you know, individual evaluation and forgetting that, you know, there are structural features that explain why, you know, in certain parts of the, of, of the world, we have different crimes and some crimes are more, happen more often than others, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm? So I think there's this other kind of worry. Yeah, um, so that seems right. I guess I, I wanted, I was just focusing on the sort of more, more mechanistic stuff, given the, the sort of audience and what, we were, what we've been talking about. But I mean, the model, I mean, even Adrian Rain's model is gonna be a biopsychosocial model, right? So it's not that there, there won't be, this is really a bit of what uh, Adina said too. It's not like, so even, even the Caspi stuff, like, so um, it's a gene environment interaction. So even that's good, it's got a piece of the environment built in. Um, so that's, that's and that's gonna be true a lot of these things. I, I, is this, so it, let me ask if this is an analog, because I, I would, uh, so there are two things you, so in, in the US we have, we're very, uh, apparently uh, willing to uh, dose very large segments of poor and especially minority community children with psychostimulants as an effort to get them to behave because they have behavior problems. And, you, and, and so you're trying to fix a problem like that. And the, 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 the problem 
doesn't address the actual source of the problem. The, the solution doesn't actually address the source of the problem. So what you'd want is to fix these communities and invest in these schools so that you didn't have 50 kids, 56 year olds in a classroom where none of them can behave because it's anarchy. And the solution ought not be, I mean, that's another one. That's, that's one, I guess, where I'm just trying to give an analogy to what I take, to, take you to be saying, which is that if the focus is on one piece of it and there's a biological solution, for instance, or a, or a psychopharmacological solution, you won't address any of the structural underlying structural problems, right? I mean, that's that's the idea yep. that it gets it wrong in that way. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I I would I guess I I didn't say this part or explain it, but it it, it is a worry. It's part of the worry I think with. If it's like a kind of if it's you're essentializing it a biological way, so I make it so that um, then there's going to be no reason to fix. Then you're just not only are you dangerous, so we're not going to take any effort to fix you, maybe because you're like you're inherently dangerous. But anybody else that is like you is going to be dangerous as well. But it could be the reason all of you are individually dangerous is because you're in the same community. That's right. And the community and the community is to blame. Yeah, for sure. So that that's part of the worry. I apparently didn't I wasn't as clear about that, um, but it, it, it's the worry. It's part of the double edged sword, I think. Because if, if if what what this did, if what this does is move people away from like thinking people deserve these think bad things to happen to them, but it leaves you thinking that they're sort of intrinsically dangerous, then you're not gonna fix anything. You're just gonna get better at detecting and detaining dangerous things, right? Right. Yeah. It will leave that stuff you said like in place. And so I, I took it that part of the benefit of the not anti-punishment, <laughs> to go back to Adina's question, we'll just say like the, the move from like, Quarantine, the move towards quarantine. Part of that is that it's 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 not just quarantine. It's wed to a public health model, the focus of which is to address precisely the sorts of things you're talking about. So so I am on. I 100% think you're right that that should be part of the focus, and then to connect like you, what you said with what Adina said. Um, the worry is if people are misunderstanding all of this and it's not made clear, you, you get something out of it that might even be worse than what we have. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Thanks a yeah. lot. I didn't, I didn't think it was an objection. I was just like, Oh no, 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 no. I took it. No, I took it to be, no, it's, 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 this is what I'm trying to, this is part of what I figured out. Telling me here that there, there's a bunch of people in the queue. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, Thomas, we do have a lot of questions. So uh, I, I, I want to, to call Walter. Walter, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Please. So uh, uh, thanks, Thomas. Every time I hear this, I learn more. Uh, but, but this time it struck me that there's a big difference between quarantine and putting somebody in prison. If my next door neighbor gets sick with something that can't be controlled without quarantining them, I feel sorry for them. I don't feel angry at them. But if somebody, if my next door neighbor rapes my daughter uh, and gets sent to prison for that, for the sake of safety, for public safety, I don't feel pity for them. I feel angry at them. So I want to know what are the implications of your arguments and views for how we feel about these people, not whether we send them to prison or not, but how do we feel about them? Yeah. Well, I guess what I wanna say is we, we should, this is the part where, um, this is the thing I, I, talk, I find myself talking to my students about more than other things when this comes up, which is that I, I feel deeply retributivistic in these, if I imagine these contexts, like you just said, I can imagine being like filled with furious anger and in in a, in a, in a, in vengeance even, you know? But I don't, I wanna say it's not justified, 
in the right way. It's not that I shouldn't be angry. It's just like maybe the degree of it or I should be angry at the world or angry at the universe that it's structured so that these sorts of things happen, but it's not, it's not as agentially directed. So you're right. I mean, in this context, Sal Smolansky says, he would say something like what I'm talking about, these quarantine models, he calls it punishment. Right, I'm just, I'm suggesting we should punish people rather than punish them. And he thinks that, that the problem is that no one is gonna think like, you can't, like no one's gonna be satisfied who's been victimized or whose loved ones have been victimized that the people have received punishment instead of punishment, right? So there, so there is that. I mean, so I don't, I, I, I can't, and it's so that, that might be why it's so, sti it's so sticky, it's so hard to move people. Because even in my case, I can't make the um, I can't make the emotional response go away just because my theoretical beliefs have shifted out from under them. But, but let me let me just see how would yeah. you explain your theory to your daughter who just got raped by your neighbor? You're going to go, yeah, I feel really angry at him, but I think I shouldn't feel angry at him because I'm not justified. I should feel pity for the person who just raped you. Well, what I do you think, think this is going to really change yeah. our interpersonal relationships in ways that might create problems? Well, I think it's like there maybe there's a difference in being angry about or angry at. So let's just like set aside a garden variety case. Just set it, set a pick a case where the person um, is having like uh, paranoid delusions or like what you do in those cases where someone who's mentally unwell and who's not guilty by reason of insanity. So in those cases, you're, you're still like just as angry that it happened. You're no less angry that it happened. You're no less devastated that it happened. But you might understand why like punishing them didn't make any sense. And the question, so like, I guess that that's just a way of saying like, so we, we, we can already imagine at least a case where another person did something horrible that made you like angry, depressed, sad, tragic and all that, where we already do for those individuals what we could just do for everybody. And what you might want to say, which I take it is what you're saying, is the difference is those are excuses. And so we already have like a framework for excusing behavior, but it can't be you excuse all behavior because then the notion of excuse like you lose, loses its meaning. I mean, that's like, yeah, for sure. Like that is absolutely for sure. The question is like, what would we lose? Um, it's interestingly, like it might be that we would, uh, it depends on how localized it remained. So if you meant, like, if you asked, do, you, do I think we should just universally excuse all misbehavior at any level of analysis and occurrence so that now, like, my friend doesn't pick me up when he said he would because he chose to have drinks instead, and, like, now all of it's excused, then, like, society is unworkable. So I, that part, I think, is true. So I, I, can't, I, I can't want it to be that this is going to trickle down to everything. We're probably going to have to pick a cutoff for some very small range of bad things. And those things are just treated differently. I mean, I take it. I got it. I have to say something like that. Right. So something like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's, a good, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's the, 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 what do you say to your daughter thing? I, I'll give you one last one example, Walter, because you'll appreciate this. So Tamler Summers, who was one of the only, there aren't a lot of skeptics that are in the business. <laughs> And he was one of them. And you know when he gave it up? When his daughter was like three or four years old. And he thought about what that meant and what it meant if someone did something to her, whatever else. And he thought, well, man, I can't, like, there's no coherent way of maintaining this unless you're just treating it as a theoretical abstraction. And so that he was like, that's, he, I, he's, I, I, he's a per, that is an example that I give when I talk about this, because I think he, there's something, there's something to that. And the question is like, how, how can I keep part of this without just having to revert back like Tamler did? So maybe like the idea is like somewhere I got to find a, a happy medium, but you're, you're absolutely right that it, it can't just be, if the view universe, if the, if the view generalized such that there's no difference between excuses and unexcused behavior at any level, then it's a, it's a reductio. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Um, um... I want to come back to, to the question why, why it might be so difficult to convince your father. Of <laughs> you never met my father. <laughs> <laughs> so by saying that 
the criminal is not responsible for what he is doing, you are also saying that your father is not responsible for not becoming criminal. So, and I think that is a major psychological problem that people want to um, want to have the idea that they um, can be responsible for not becoming criminal. And in principle, you take that away from them. And I think that might be very problematic. I mean, we have this idea, others are responsible for their behavior, but, but that I'm not criminal is my, is my virtue in you. And, and I think this is the other side of the, of, of the coin. Um, so you undermine people's um, idea of um, agency by that. Yeah. Um, it's tricky. I, I, I think uh, I don't want to, what I want to, what I want to do, maybe this is a better way of looking at it. I, I didn't talk about it this way. I mean, I often talk about my thinking that I don't have free will or that we don't have free will and responsibility. Um, but I mean something like what Josh and Green, mean, what Green and Cohen and those guys mean. I don't think we have what most people think we have. This goes back to what I said in response to Jonathan's talk earlier. Um, I, I think we have to pay attention to the things we can do. And uh, we have powers of deliberation and, uh, and, and, and we have, uh, most of us have a kind of uh, moral reasons responsiveness to certain kinds of uh, you know, things that we, enter, we engage with in the world. And these are all important. And they, they, they if, if I'm uh, free of uh, psychotic delusions and I'm not, I don't have a gun to my head, if I'm free of all the excuses and I'm like of a sound mind and, and, and everything else, then uh, I, I am uh, accountable in some ways in a way that other people aren't. Uh, and we have to keep track of that. We're, we're tracking a feature that makes me a dependable person, a dependable colleague, someone you can depend on not to steal your stuff or lie to you or whatever else. And all those things are important, but I don't need dessert, a kind of like deep dessert or a kind of like very, very robust sense of agency to, to make all of those distinctions. So like, I'm not, I don't like, I, so I'd say like what I have is just a very deflationary picture of agent, I, I call it like agency and accountability or answerability. I mean, those are slightly different. Um, so, I, so I don't want to throw all that away. Um, I want to say that if you have, if you, if you, if you believe or do dangerous things that harm other people, um, then you should not do those things. And for most people, they can, you can be moved in the right direction. Sometimes you can't. Yes, yeah, so I, 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 that's not. I'm not sure that's very helpful. But I, I guess to say I don't want to. For me, I don't want to give. About, yeah. For me, it's not about the, that. That this might go together theoretically, but I think that is what it might do psychological, psychologically with people, and that's why they are so resistant, or one reason why they are so resistant um, against this idea. Oh, I see. Oh, right. But then, so then, what I want to say. Th that's fine. Good. That's helpful. Then, what I want to say is because this does come up with my students when they do ask me these questions because they're curious because what I'm saying seems uh, when we read stuff like we read the Paraboom Caruso thing, um, it's clearly possible for people to do it, to have these views. It might be hard and you get these things like I was saying where you're a bit torn and your experiences might be detached or your emotions might be detached from your commitments, theoretical commitments and these things. But it's like I, I know I can I can sort of model what I want with by by using my own behavior. So it's it might be true that they would be they'd be likely to do this. So that's I in many cases what you say is probably right. I want to say it's it's probably it's it's not true that that has to be the way that it goes or that those associations have to be torn apart in those ways because at least for some of us they're not torn apart in those ways. Um, yeah, so I, I, I might even like, I'm not, I don't do comparative philosophy, but I mean, I, I do read a bit of like Buddhist philosophy and the noted, the, the, the sort of non, 
judgmental nature of that and the sort of deflationary agency in all of these things, um, that, that, that's proof positive that these things that we think are impossible are possible for people. And we might not think that's the way we ought to be, but it's not like just because you give those things up, like societies fall apart to the extent to which an awful lot of people seemingly already have those sorts of beliefs and values and their societies are moving along uh, just fine. And so I, rather than looking at myself and modeling it myself, I mean, this, this might be a way of responding uh, to Walter's example earlier also. Um, so I, I guess it's, I think there's more flexibility um, and there's more, uh, yeah, more flexibility. And there's, it, it's possible maybe to keep more of what you're worried about, even if you get rid of some of these other things that I'm, I'm suggesting or theoretically problematic, but I, I completely get, yeah. So uh, two questions about whether you can move them and um, what it would look like if you did. Um, what you said is, is surely part of why it's hard to move people. I think that's gotta be true, yeah. So it's good. Okay, thanks. Sure. Hi, I Tom. couldn't tell who that was. That was Marcel Brass. Oh, good. Okay. I, I only saw the back. Oh, you see my face. All I saw was the back of your head, Marcel. I thought, I thought. <laughs> and I'm, I'm here. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I've almost heard two talk or talks from two different people. You know, there's the idealistic uh, academic Thomas, yeah. who is advocating this Harry Bloom Caruso like view that there's no self or no agent and therefore no blame. And then there's the pragmatic Thomas, who's saying, yes, I want to move people and I realize how hard that is going to be. And, you know, I'm reminded in, in the martial arts, there's different strategies. Like in Shotokan Karate, you attack the enemy at their weak points, like their throat. Whereas in Aikido, you, you, you use the momentum of the enemy or the opponent rather against them. And so speaking to the pragmatic Thomas, um, you might become more Machiavellian and say, okay, given that the vast majority of people have these libertarian sentiments, rather than take on those libertarian sentiments, how can I uh, use that, those views to accomplish my aim? So you become Machiavellian. And so one proposal to do that would be um, to, to in fact focus on the notions of rehabilitation and prevention as um, the best ways to implement a libertarian view. So for example, in terms of prevention, you know, uh, you know yeah. Uh, what is genetically given is not a deterministic outcome, but a potential. And that, uh, you know, the data I think show, at least for, say, intelligence, that about 40, maybe as much as 50% of the variance is accounted for by genetics. Surprisingly little by shared environment, only like 10%, but still this leaves like 40 to 50% that is not accounted for. And that could within the libertarian frame, point of view, even if though you even though you yourself don't believe it, could be uh, the basis for a kind of change of society that emphasizes the capacity for self-forming acts, where you yourself and your own decisions are for part of the environment that then shapes your outcomes later. So you could you know focus on educating people about the the value of prevention within a, a libertarian framework, and something similar for rehabilitation. I'm just wondering, you know, can I appeal to a Machiavellian version of you that would try to accomplish your aims despite your disbelief in libertarian free will? Yeah, so it's, it's good. I think I haven't seen you in a, in a while. It's good, to, it's good to see you if I only see the back of your head for now. Um, yeah, hi, Peter. How are you? Um, so I guess what I would say is that um, the Machiavellian piece, so if, you, if we're assuming that I'm like the king for a day or the prince in this case, um, and so I have the ability to exercise like top-down control in a way that I just, I, so I'm able to just give them the rehabilitation stuff basically, um, but I do package it in a way that I tell them it's for this thing that's giving them what they want. Then that, then I'm happy to, I guess, go that way. Although I have reservations that historically when you do those things, in a top-down way, it generates problems downstream. Um, we're seeing it right now with the abortion debate. It's, it's, there, so the, the, there are worries about sort of top-down impositions of, chain, of, of ideological viewpoints in that way. 
Um, so I'm not sure, but um, but yeah, I mean, I, but to the extent to which I don't have that kind of power, the only way of doing it in a democratic society is through them or like either through them, like you get them to change or you get enough people on your side. Like that's the only stuff you got. And I don't have very, very many people on my side for this one. So like, I'm literally like nearly everybody disagrees with me for different reasons. And then it's harder, you know? So then I really got to figure out, it's probably why I focus more on the, just the descriptive question of which direction this stuff might go in its own accord, what, no matter what I say or do about it. Um, but you're, you're right. Like I, I would, but the, so yes, I would, I guess I would, I'm not opposed on if, there, if it were the only way of getting any of this done for the kind of strategy you, su you suggested. Um, yeah, but this, yeah. this, this genetic approach, um, is really, I think risky in the sense that it might lead to, uh, enhanced genetic determinism and essentialism, mm -hmm. like you say, and yeah. people would say, you know, they're, you're inherently dangerous. And, yeah. uh, you know, when you actually look at the data for most traits, though, it's very polygenic, right? So take intelligence, the, the single allele that is most predictive of intelligence, the COMT comp gene is very, it can only account for a, a couple of percent of the variance. Yeah. And it really, it seems to be hundreds of genes. Um, and then, you know, that's the comp gene is also the gene that happens to be most predictive of schizophrenia too, right? So it's not like it's a death sentence to be, you know, or whatever. It's not written in the genes. So I, I, I don't know. I think there's, there's a real danger, like you say, that this will all blow up in your face if you advocate too strongly that yeah. there's genetic determinism because people will say, well, these people are doomed. You've got to throw them in prison forever. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. So that, like I said, so part of the project is just wanting to better understand the direction things are going to go, like just as, as they organically do. Um, and I don't think it will go in the direction that people like me would like it to go. That's, that's the, the point, partly for what you just said, it's related to what, um, what Adina said. Um, it's, it's related to a couple of the questions that have already come up because people are going to misunderstand these things. And so the effect, whatever effect it does have, if it has any effect, whatever effect it does have will be predicated largely on misunderstandings that then themselves could be dangerous. So even if it dislodged a dessert based framework, what is left in place is going to be problematic, problematic on my, given my own preferences. So that's part of the, that. Now I'm, I'm happy you guys are, because this is, this is the part I've got to think through more carefully. So it's been very nice to hear a couple of different ways of thinking through uh, this, this issue. So that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, we have still a lot of questions. Uh, the ones that are in the chat, maybe uh, you, you have them, Thomas. I'd like yeah. uh, to call Marcelo. Is Marcelo there? Because he, he yeah. was the first one uh -huh. to raise his hand. And you oh, have sure. the ones on the chat and then yeah, you can, uh, okay. maybe we can send uh, them to you or the email of the the oh uh, yeah of course the, the yeah. so uh marcelo please hi thanks uh thomas i think i have also this uh, weird feeling that Renato was mentioning because i, I think yeah. i have been uh, largely influenced by your work and uh, the things you, you post on the internet blogs and, and that stuff that was very important in my uh, studies in philosophy so thanks for that too uh I have been thinking a lot about this implementability question. And one idea that uh, always comes to my mind is that maybe there's a like levels or uh, a classification of things that are harder to, to implement and others that are not so much. And that could work also like uh, at test cases that we could see how they work uh, and then uh, assess the, the perspective for the the prospects for, for those cases that are more difficult to, to, to implement according to, to the views people ordinarily have. So as a general uh, maybe starting point, some of those uh, suggestions that we have now to, to prevent criminality and violence, for example, uh, things that uh, Rain mentions and, and others, you have some interventions that, that can be done early in childhood. So mm -hmm. I think those are very, 
uncontroversial. You, you, if you have ways to prevent uh, young children from, from having deficits that uh, will also increase their likelihood to commit crimes in the future. So I think uh, there is little opposition to that. That could be a great starting point. And you also yeah. end up with less punishment because if they work well, uh, you will have less crime in the future and you uh, <laughs> conservatively uh, reduce punishment without changing retribution. So another step that I think might work is uh, maybe here a more critical case. Uh, there has been a lot of work on uh, family or parental ad advice. So the case of uh, physical punishment of children, uh, there, there, I, I think there's a very interesting work there and that uh, has not been very uh, much considered in the, the free will and more responsibility literature because uh, the argument there is that uh, physical punishment is very bad for, for the future of those children, uh, in, including in the possibility of increasing violent tendencies. And it's very hard to, to move parents away from that. And many programs to, to try to change uh, parental attitudes about how to educate their, their children, they have been tested and uh, the, the assessments of how they, they can, how acceptable they are and how they turn out uh, uh, in the actual education of, of children. So I think that case is mixed because parents have an interest in their children that uh, the larger society will not have in the, the, the health and, 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 and well-being of uh, criminals. So that might be a, a case that's more intermediate because there you can have, uh, you have this interest in the well-being of the, the targets of the punishment in this case and, and you want to not to punish the, them that way. And uh, finally, I have, a, I think it's more like a question here. Uh, I, I'm wondering now uh, whether it makes a difference in how much people support punishment if you frame the, the results uh, from certain studies in, in these neuro and biological prediction models. Uh, in the, the cases of psychopaths, for example, you can say that they have decision deficits or they, they have uh, less control of their over their, their actions that's one way of describing as a problem in agency but they also have uh, uh, problems in processing punishment in uh, uh, when they are punished to adjust their behavior and i i think that's a, a different way of describing this these studies and i wonder whether you have something uh, some evidence of whether or not that uh, impacts punishment attitudes differently so describing saying that the guy, no matter how harsher, uh, harsh he's punished, he'll keep repeating the, the, the behavior, the, the violent behavior. And on the other hand, saying that he has impulse control and uh, problems uh, which make him <laughs> make bad decisions. So I think there might, it's a, a question here, how that why might turn out in terms of how much you, we want to punish that kind of case described in different ways. I'm not sure there's any evidence on that. So that's a question. Sure, um, good, thank you. Uh, I don't know whether it's good that there are three of us who have these wonky views. It might just be it's better to have crazy views in the company of other people with crazy views, but, um, but I'm glad that we're on, this, we're on the same page. Um, I, I'm gonna go slightly out of order that you asked, Marcelo. Uh, I'm gonna look at the second thing you said and then the first thing and then we'll go to the final thing. Um, the first two are related, which is, um, let's imagine you, you mentioned range. We'll talk about some of the stuff you discussed. This. Let's imagine you tell people, um, you do a better job of informing people just how bad it is to expose, uh, fetuses in utero to nicotine. I mean, it's like, it, it is, it, 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 it confers a, a sort of shocking risk for future antisocial behavior. Um, controlling for other things. Um, and so what you want is you wanna convince mothers not to smoke. But part of the way you do that is giving a kind of biologically reductive thing where it's like, if you expose a fetus, it's hard to think that doing something when it, the, it is a fetus is gonna affect how it behaves when it's 15, but it does. So, that, that's, so there you can use the sort of biological prediction to try to encourage Mothers, for instance, not to expose, I get this, that's the first thing. So you were using like what, what you can do in children. I'm saying that same model, even for, even if we look like things that are in utero, 
Alcohol exposure is one we now think is more obvious, but nicotine is another one. Um, making sure you're eating properly. I mean, so all those, and you might be able to get women to do a better job. I'm not, I'm not putting all on the women. It's just they're, they're the ones that have the control over the exposure. But um, to do a better job of protecting uh, their soon-to-be children, which will make them less likely. This is another way to prevent things. will make them less likely to engage in maybe antisocial behavior down the line. The other thing you mentioned is something like, so Rain, like the, the, the data on omega-3, omega-6 is pretty surprising and it's consistent across other species. So we get it in dogs, we get it, I forget a couple other um, species where they've looked at it. But so you can also seemingly like minimize the likelihood of aggressive behavior with something as simple as omega-3, omega-6. The cross-cultural studies on um, human exposure relative to, for cultures that focus on have fish centric diets rather than not. You get these nice correlations with violent behavior and these other sorts of things. So that'd be one where um, it, those are the sorts of things that seem like fairly low hanging fruit. And it, getting people to care about them requires getting them to think about the biological, the, the, well, I won't just only, not only biological, but the kind of different causes of human antisocial behavior. So that, th those are easier inroads, if that was what you're asking. Like, if the, or those are easier ways of initiating these conversations we can have with other people and with society. And the sort of thing you're suggesting is not, hey, let's get rid of prisons. <laughs> I mean, it's something like, hey, just maybe if you can't afford fish, then give your kids more omega-3 and omega-6s, or even we'll provide it, right? Because the society will just provide supplementation in these ways. Um, so that's that for me. That's maybe that's a, a softer way of peddling this stuff, um, and, and making a change. Uh, and if it worked, then it gives people, it enables people to connect the way that these different sorts of biological and environmental things influence uh, macro behaviors that we normally don't think about. So that was the, those are the that stuff I like. The stuff you said there, I think, is helpful. That'd be the. So I'm just giving like maybe some examples. Mindfulness training for kids is another one. And there are a bunch of these that are like this. Um, I, I don't remember if it was Hinato or uh, Gabrielle mentioned the uh, biofeedback earlier instead of Riddle. And I mean, there are going to be a bunch of these that I think we could probably do that are probably pretty simple. And the case for them is compelling. Uh, the other piece that you asked, that sort of the, the other piece was about whether or not um, framing psychopaths in different ways. Um, I don't know. The only the only paper I know of that does anything with uh, the psychopath in that way, like a study on like, is, is the stuff by Aspenwall. And I think that was in nature. Or maybe that wasn't in nature. Well, anyway, that part doesn't matter. I think it was, but I'm not positive. Um, where they, but that they, there they only, they only changed whether the explanation of the, uh, of the, uh, the disorder was uh, folk psychological or uh, neurological. And what you asked was something different. It wasn't about how you described it in that terms. It was like, which piece of the behavior you focus on. So if you focused on the psychopath as precisely the sort of person and you cite studies that show like they don't respond to punishment or whatever else. Um, I don't know anything like that. I'm, op I'm open for, for doing them. If you, want to, if, you want to, if you want to email me, I'm happy that that's, that's like the sort of thing I'd be happy to work on. So me too, know. me too. <laughs> right, cool. Yeah, well, we could do a whole bunch. There are a bunch of them to be done. Cool. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thomas, thank you very much. A round of applause for Thomas. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd just like to tell uh, all the others uh, that sent questions, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have already uh, expended a lot of your our time. And uh, so, Thomas, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And tomorrow, then, we, we come back with the morning sessions. Okay, thank you. Hey, can, I ask, can I ask a question? Yes. Can you guys email uh, me the chat printout? A copy of the chat when when you're okay. all done we, we will do perfect uh, thomas that one, way I get... one one last thing we have already ended but just this question yeah. I, I this question this comment i have to make uh i yeah. do have not one uh, but two small daughters and i do not feel i have to to quit being a, a skeptic i i mean uh my answer to this has always been all right i can still think about this rationally and not want just vengeance as long as i'm not part uh, of of uh, uh, an injustice like this one water mentioned if i did 
then I would not be able to think rationally about this, this kind of stuff. And that's exactly why, why the state exists, right? So you can take justice out of the offended's hand, right? I, yeah. I, I don't even think uh, anyone would say a judge uh, would be the best person to, to judge other cases, not, not even his case, other cases, if he went through something like this. I mean, yeah. someone had a, a, a raped kid, uh, he would yeah, not yeah. be a, a nice criminal judge. I mean, so that's the emotional part is. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. Hmm. That's it. So that, yeah, so yes, what you just said sounds right to me. That is the way, that is the way to do it. Okay. <laughs> All right, good night, Thomas.